Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Today, we are going to be talking about um, a few more reinforcement learning topics. Um, the, the lecture here says uh, MDPs and dynamic programming. And today's lecture is actually kind of short. We're not covering a ton of stuff today. And the reason for that was because I thought that I was going to do the Connect Four um, tournament today. So the assignment three submission. But I gave a, an extended due date for that of um, two days ago. And so because it's only two days ago, I didn't have time to, uh, or the TAs didn't have time to uh, mark the assignments yet. And so um, we can't do the tournament today. So today's lecture was kind of short in anticipation for the tournament, but the tournament's not happening. So I'll do the tournament in a future lecture. Um, so maybe what I'll do is there's no lecture on Tuesday because it's Remembrance Day. So maybe I'll just do kind of a bonus stream on Tuesday where I do the tournament. How about that? And, and you don't have to tune in, so please take your Remembrance Day holiday. But I will do the tournament on Tuesday uh, just so we did it. Because I, I, it's really fun and I don't want to not do that. So instead of it being today, it'll be on Tuesday. Alrighty, so let's hop into the slides for today. And uh, we'll see what we're going to cover. Okay, so lecture 15, we are going to continue on with some reinforcement learning uh, terminology. So today we're talking about uh, continuing tasks, Markov decision processes, and dynamic programming. Now, just as a quick note, um, I'm not going into any real super in-depth stuff for any of these three topics, how, because it's not like crucial to the evaluation of this course. Um, the in-depth stuff will start with the next lecture, the, the following two lectures on Monte Carlo uh, decision making and then temporal difference learning. However, those two topics do need some of this terminology in order to be taught correctly. Uh, so if you, if you want, um, in the book, chapter four in the reinforcement learning textbook for the course is all about dynamic programming. So you can read all about this there. Okay. Um, so, uh, episodic versus continuing tasks. All right. Uh, so just recall, what is an episodic task? So an, e an episodic task is a task that has a sequence of actions, usually not very long, and then some terminating state. Okay. So episodes of episodic tasks are considered independent. So some examples of an episodic task could be like a play of a game. So for example, a hand of poker or a hand of blackjack, or maybe uh, one pathfinding task through a maze or something like that. Okay. Um, and in an episodic task, we have a finite number of time steps, right? So we're going to start at time T and then the return G of T from time T up until the end of the episode is just the sum of all the future rewards at time step t plus one, t plus two, all the way up to t. So the return for an episode is the sum of all the rewards for that episode. And remember that the object of reinforcement learning is to determine a policy that maximizes expected return for that episode. However, um, some tasks don't easily break down into episodes, right? What if I have like a Roomba va vacuum and that's just going all the time? Or I have a human, right? Or I want a robot that interacts with people and there's not like exact episodes with terminating states. It's just sort of this continuing task. And so continuing tasks are tasks that go on without any sort of time limit. So for example, a long lifespan robot or maybe a control task. Like if you, if you have a robot um, in a manufacturing line that's constantly doing something, right? That's a, that's a control task. So the episodic return formula doesn't work because in the episodic return formula, we had this terminal step T and we're just summing up this finite set of rewards to, to form that. So what do we do? Do we have T E like T is that infinity or is G T infinity? So that's not really going to work. And so what they have done in the reinforcement learning world is they introduced the concept of discounting. 
So discounting, the agent, we were changing our definition of the goal of a reinforcement learning agent from just maximizing future return to now the agent is going to select actions that the sum of discounted rewards is maximized. Okay, so we are introducing this term gamma, which is called the discount rate. Gamma is going to be between zero and one. And what gamma does, it doesn't change things too much. Um, turns out basically what we've been using all along is the same formula as this, but with gamma equal to one. Okay, so gamma just lets us do some neat things. So what we have here is we have the summation. So from k, k is the time step. Uh, from zero to infinity for k, we have the discounted sum of rewards. So we raise gamma to the kth power times the reward that we get at each time step. So here is the formula. If we if we write this out, um, reward by reward, we have our return now. Instead of just rt plus one plus rt plus two plus rt plus three. It's gamma times RT plus one plus gamma squared times RT plus two plus all the way up, okay? And we sum this to infinity. So the discount rate determines the present value of future rewards. So a reward you get K time steps in the future is only worth gamma to the power of K times one as if it was an immediate return, okay? Oh, sorry, this thing up here is just the formula that I had written down, so you've already seen that. If gamma is zero, the agent only cares about the next reward. If gamma is equal to one, then the reward formula is the same as an episodic task. So as gamma approaches one, the agent becomes more farsighted and cares more about distant things. So let's just have a look at this formula again. Okay, so if gamma is one, then this is the same formula because gamma here, one, gamma squared when gamma one is still one. So if gamma is one, we have the same formula as the uh, episodic task. However, if gamma is zero, then we only care about the immediate reward. Okay, so As agent, uh, sorry, as gamma approaches one, the agent becomes more farsighted, meaning that it will value things in the future uh, more and more. All right. So returns at successive time steps are related in a mathematically important way with this formula. All right. So we have our return formula here, which is now equal to, oh, I believe I had the wrong formula written down. Just one second. So let me show you the editing process in real time. Uh, this gamma should not have been here. This gamma should have been a, there we go. So I had the wrong formula written down. Perfect. Yes. So do, do, do. Cause gamma to the power, see how I did that? So I had a mistake there. Gamma to the power of zero is one. So there's no, there shouldn't be a term there. So I apologize, I had a mistake in the slides. Let's go back to the presentation. So the return formula is now RT plus one plus gamma times RT plus two plus gamma squared RT plus three, et cetera, et cetera. But if we take the gamma outside, so if we put, let me uh, draw this. If we put brackets right here, okay, and then we take the gamma outside, then we're taking one gamma from each of these. So gamma squared here becomes gamma, gamma cubed becomes gamma squared. If we take the gamma outside, then now we have our next reward plus gamma times this term. But this term is just equal to g of t plus one. Because if we look up here, g of t is r of t plus one plus gamma rt plus two. Here we have rt plus two plus gamma rt plus three. And that's just the return following the next time step, okay? So what this says is that our return following this time step is equal to gamma times the return following the next time step plus 
our current return or our current reward. Okay, see how that see how that works. So it's related in that by figuring out if we somehow had the next return and the reward, we could figure out gamma. We don't necessarily need to have all of these rewards. Okay. So in the book, they introduce this unified mathematical notation. And the this notation is good to have because they want a unified notation for both episodic tasks and continuing tasks. Because there's this still this, you know, effect that, well, in a continuing task, you have essentially infinite time steps, but in an episodic task, you don't have infinite time steps. So in order to make this formula work for episodic tasks, what they do is they modify episodic tasks and turn them into continuing tasks. So what they do is they add one final state and they call that the absorbing state. So let's say we had an episodic task. So our episodic task is like this. It has um, three states in it. So we, we were at state zero, we got a reward, we went to state one. We got a reward, we went to state two, and we got another reward. That's an episodic task. But in order to turn that episodic task into a continuing task, what we do is we add this final state that essentially just keeps looping on itself. Okay, and for that final st for that final state, our reward is always going to be zero. So that means now we can use this infinite summation on this episodic task because anything beyond state three just always has a return of zero. Okay, so that just lets us apply this formula, this infinite summation, to um, tasks that have non-infinite duration. It's, it sounds a little confusing at first, but it's, it's not so bad. Before we move on uh, to the next topic, or the next thing, um, I just want to bring up what we talked about last time, and that was action values, right? So remember that we said that Q of A is our current estimate of the value of doing action A. And we went through a whole example of estimating QA with our bandits, right? So, the value of a specific action will vary depending on the state that it was issued. So, at first we just talked about, okay, we have a bunch of actions in front of us. But, then we moved on to this example, where instead of just having a Q of A, meaning the value of an action, we, we mentioned that actions have value given the context of a state that we are in when we take those actions. Right? So moving up is good if the goal is up, but not if the goal is down from the particular state. So Q of SA is the value or our estimate of the value of doing action A at state S. And so I drew this diagram where at every state of our environment, right? Just picture assignment two, some pathfinding type environment. Um, we're at a state and we have actions. So that action might be up, left, down, or right. And we can consider this problem to be the bandit problem, right? Because we don't know the true value of going up yet. We don't know the true value of going down yet. We've got to pull all these levers a significant amount of times until we can estimate the value of those, of those actions. So what we have then is we have Q of SA. This A is U for up. Here we have Q of SR, Q of SD, and these like up, down, left, and right. So after some number of, of pulling of these levers of trying up, down, left, and right, we have our Q value, which is the action value function, right? So here we are at a given state S, we are trying different actions, and we are recording what we think their value is. So some new stuff on top of that. Overall, like here, we're only talking about taking one action, right? We only have one pull of the lever at each at this state. We're only taking Q of SA. However, after we take that action, let's say this is a pathfinding task, we're going to be taking more actions in the future, right? And so my value or my estimate of this value is only really going to make sense in the context of what I do later, right? So, 
overall value only makes sense if we speak in the context of a policy. And remember, we're representing a policy pi here. So q pi, this is supposed to be a superscript. So q pi is called the action value function. And q pi is the expected return starting from state s, taking action a, and then following the policy. Okay, so here we don't have a little pi here because we are only talking about the value of doing that immediate action, right? Of pulling the slot lever. There's nothing else that we're talking about that happens after that. It's just, I take this one action and I get a value. So that's Q of SA. However, Q pi of SA says the following. Q pi of SA would be, I'm gonna take this action and then I'm gonna follow my policy from there on out. And that policy might lead me to something bad, it might lead me to something good. So Q pi of a state and an action is the expected return starting from state S, taking action A, and then following policy pi. Okay, so remember, pol a policy pi maps um, from states to actions, your probability of doing states at those actions. So that's the sentence that you should remember, but here it is mathematically. So Q pi of SA is the expected value, okay? The expected value following policy pi of the return G of T with the current state ST equal to S and the current action AT equal to A. So this is the mathematical way of stating this sentence, okay? So it's the expected return starting from state S and taking action A and then following policy pi. And if you think about it, we can talk about that in terms of our function here, right? By doing the following. So Q pi of SA is the expected return or the expected value of the sum of the future discounted rewards, given that we're starting at state S right now and taking action A, okay? So that's, that's, the, that's another mathematical way of looking at that. And why is that? It's because this right here, this GT term, that is equal to this, right? We just said that G sub T is equal to this on this slide here. Oh, sorry. Where, where are we? Where are we? There we go. So that's what, that's what this function is. Okay. Now we're going to introduce a new variable called V. V is the state value function. So what is the value of being at a given state? Okay. So V pi of S is the expected return starting from state S and then following policy pi. So again, it's, it's the same formula as this, except we are not assuming that we've taken an action first, okay? So you're essentially at a state and you wanna say, okay, well, let me go back to my state example. So if I'm at state S, I want to ask myself, what is the value of being at this state, okay? Well my value is intrinsically linked to the actions that I'm going to take. And so I don't know a value unless I'm talking about the context of a given policy, right? So like, what is the value of me standing right here in front of my computer? Well, it's pretty neutral. I guess it's pretty good. I'm teaching, right? So my value of being here is good within the context of my policy of, of Dave's policy of like teaching and then maybe going to go get some dinner and then hanging out and watching some Netflix or something, right? But if my policy here was to like bang my head on the table and stub my toe, then my value of being here wouldn't be very good, right? I know this is a little bit confusing and there's Q's and V's and stuff. Q takes the current action into account. V doesn't, okay? So, what V is saying is that if I'm given some policy, V of S is the value 
of being at a state and then eventually following that policy. So it's just the expected value following a policy pi of the future sum of rewards, which is the return g of t. But I do start at that state, okay? So the only difference between this and this is that q, you are estimating a, an action value, meaning what is the value of doing this action and then following a policy, where v is just the value of a state. I'm not assuming any action, I'm just following my policy from this state. So v is a state value function, q is an action value function, okay? These are just the, the standard uh, reinforcement learning ways of, of denoting them, q and v. Okie doke. We'll get back to some stuff about the state value function, but first I want to talk about the Markov property. We've, we've already kind of explained the Markov property in an earlier um, lecture, but you didn't know it was called the Markov property yet. So in the reinforcement learning framework, agents make decisions as a function of the state of the environment, right? I look around, I see the state, and I make a decision. So the state of an environment is whatever information is available to the agent. Remember all those percept stuff? So the agent is going to look around and see some stuff. Maybe it can see all the stuff. Maybe it can't see all the stuff and it's going to make a decision. If a state contains all the relevant information for making a decision, it's said to be Markov or to have the Markov property. And what this means intuitively is that no state history is required to play that game. So an example, of a game that has the Markov property, if we ignore the 50 move checkmate or 50 move draw thing, is chess, right? You can look at the state of a game of chess and make the optimal decision, right? You do not need to know, uh, oh, geez, just this is checkers, uh, checkers or chess, okay? So if you just look at the board state, if your agent is given the state of the board at any given time, you can make the optimal move in a game of checkers or in chess. So because you can make the optimal decision based on only what you see right now at this time state, that is said to have the Markov property. However, remember this example that we went over, the League of Legends uh, Baron snipe kill, where this player, right, only saw this much of the game. So because of this, this player, their state information at any point contained, like they didn't know the, the hit points of the Baron when they took that shot, right? So how did that player make that decision? Well, in this case, the player at like maybe a minute or two ago saw the other team walk up, right? Walk up to the Baron, start attacking, and then based on their knowledge of the game, knew approximately how much DPS that they could deal. And okay, maybe it'll take them 25 seconds to kill it. So at 24 seconds, I'll fire, fire my rocket and hope to kill it, right? So the state information available to this player was not complete. They needed to know the history leading up to that state in order to make this decision. So League of Legends and any game that doesn't have, like any game that doesn't have this complete information does not have the Markov property because we can't just make an observation of the current state and make the correct action. We need to have had history in order to do that. Okay, so in general, environment state and reward may depend on a complete action sequence. So what that means is the reward of him firing this, right, to make that decision re may have required this player to be paying attention at all stages of the game and required the complete action history of the game, which in this case it did, right? So it may depend on the complete action sequence. So the mathematical way we can phrase that is by saying the probability that the next state is S prime and the next reward is R depends on the entire sequence of state action rewards up to this point, okay? So that's what this mathematical function means, is it just means that the probability that the next state is a given state and the next reward is a given reward 
depended on or is given by the complete sequence so far. And remember, for these tasks that we're doing, we have a state, we take an action, we get a reward. A new state, a new action, a new reward. All right? So, again, that's in general. If it is in general, then that does not have the Markov property. All right. So if a Markov property holds, then the environment response at time t plus 1 depends only on a state and an action at t. So if the Markov property holds, okay, and what a great exam question this slide is, then the probability of the next state being a given state and the next reward being a given reward only depends on the current state and the current action. Okay, so this is the Markov property, if this is true. I see some questions out there in the chat. Uh, they're not currently relevant to what I am explaining, but after the lecture is over, I'll, um, I'll answer those questions for you if you stick around. Okay, so a Markov decision process, or an MDP, it's a very important um, concept. Any reinforcement learning task that satisfies the Markov property is called a Markov decision process, all right? So if state and action spaces are finite, then it's called a finite MDP, so a finite Markov decision process. So this is the definition of an MDP, and it, enca it encapsulates the definition of a reinforcement learning task within the context of what we're defining in this course. Okay, um, so an MDP is equal, well, it has five of these properties, okay, or five things go into defining an MDP. And this is a finite MDP here. So S, that is the set of states in our environment, all right? So our environment has a finite set of states that the agent can be in. A is a finite set of actions, and so the actions here let us know which actions are legal at a given state, right? So if I'm in the middle of the map, I can move up, down, left, or right. If I'm at the very top of the map, I can't move up. If I'm on the very right of the map, I can only move left, okay? So A is the finite set of actions um, that are legal from each state. P is sort of a new thing that we haven't really looked at, but it makes sense if you think about it. P is the probability of transitioning to a state, to a new state, given that you're at a current state and take a, an action, okay? So, um, P of A, S, S prime, this is the probability that when you take action A at state S, you transition to state S prime. So what does that really mean? Well. Spelled out, it's that the probability of s t plus 1 equals s prime given you're at a current state and you're at a given action. So what do you mean, Dave, the probability of transitioning to a state given another action? Well, so far, um, if I can back up a little bit, we've only had these sort of deterministic environments, okay? So for example, if I take the action up at state s, then with a 100% probability, I'm going to transition to this state, right? If I take the action right, I'm going to transition to this state. However, in some environments, if I issue the action go up, maybe there's some dice roll, or there's a critical hit, or there's something, right? And so the probability that I go from this state to this state would be... So let, let's just do a, a quick example. So let's say that whenever I go from this state to this state, so this is S prime, okay? And the action is going to be uh, right. So let's say there's a 50-50 chance that when I try and go right, I'll actually go right. So that would mean that my probability taking action right of going from S to S prime is equal to 50%. Okay? So th that's what that would mean. That my probability of taking action right and going from S to S prime is 0.5. So here, 
in the MDP definition, my probability of taking action A and going from S to S prime, well, that would just be defined for every possible state and every possible action. All right, that shows me how I get from one state to another. All right, then I have another function, which is the reward that I get if I do action A at state S and go to S prime. So this means this is the reward after I transition from state S to state S prime via action A, okay? So if I move up and I hit some lava, maybe my reward is negative. If I moved right and I hit a health pack, maybe my, um, my reward is positive, okay? And of course we have gamma, which is the discounting factor that we talked about earlier in this episode. So the, the, the goal of an MDP, okay, is to choose a policy pi that maximizes the expected return. Okay, so that, that's our goal, is to maximize this function. That's all we ever want to do is maximize this function. And this can be solved in many ways, but one way that it can be solved and we won't be implementing this in the assignment, but I want to introduce it because it's an important concept, is via dynamic programming. Um, so who out there has done any dynamic programming in a course before? This, don't worry, this is not gonna be like a really complex version of dynamic programming. Um, it's a very small subset of the broader topic of dynamic programming. So this can be solved via dynamic programming if we have a model of our environment. So what is dynamic programming? Just a quick note. It's a collection of algorithms that can compute optimal policies given a perfect model of the environment as an MDP. And the whole idea of dynamic programming is in this sentence, which is the value of the state that I'm in is somehow related to the value of my neighboring states. Okay, and I'll show an example of that. So we will use dynamic programming to compute the value function for a state. And then we're going to use the value function to compute a policy. So here's a small example of that. So say I'm doing a pathfinding example, all right? And or it doesn't necessarily need to be pathfinding, but we're in some sort of grid world where we're at a given state. Why isn't my laser pointer working? Okay, so we're at a given state x, y, and then we have these actions, move up, move right, move down, move left, okay? So let's just say this is like action zero, action one, so up, down, left, and right. Action zero, action one, action two, and action three. Let's say that I know the value of my neighboring states, but I don't know the value of my current state. So if I know that the value of this state up here is 20, and the value of this state is 10, and the value of this state is zero, and the value of this state is 30, what is the value of state S? What is the value of being here if my neighboring states have these actions? What would you say that is? Anyone know? Well, that was an excuse for me to take a drink, but you can see now that this is a hard question to answer. Someone out there said, is it the average of all the four? I don't know, is it? Someone said 40, right? Maybe it's zero, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 20, maybe it's some combination of these. Someone said 20. Here's the answer. Is that the, va and I already answered this, previously in the lecture, is that we cannot think of the value of a state without considering the policy, right? Because the policy says what we're going to do at this state. So if my policy says move up, then the value of this state is gonna be 20, right? Because I'm always moving from this state to the state that's 20. If my value, if my policy at this state, state said move down, then my value of this state is zero because I'm transitioning from this state to a value of zero, right? 
And I, if you think about it, your value at any given state is related to the next state that you're going to be at. So it depends on this action probability, right? So what is my probability of going up? What is my probability of going right? It depends on that, right? So I can only have a value if I consider what I have to do at that state. So what's my action probability? Well, let's say, for example, that I have a policy which takes an action equiprobably, meaning that I have an equal chance of going to each of these states. Okay, so I have four possible actions. I have a one-fourth chance of taking action zero, a one-fourth chance of taking action one, a one-fourth chance of taking action two, and a one-fourth chance of taking action three. So that means that my value at this state is going to be, well, if I'm going to be taking each of these with an equiprobable chance, then I'm going to weight each of them by the probability of them happening and then summing them up. So as someone said in the chat, is it the average of the four? Well, if my policy says take each of them with equal probability, then yes, it is the average of all the four. So if I take 20 divided by four, so 20 plus 10 plus zero plus 30 is 60, 60 divided by four is 15. So my value of state S if my policy says take a random action is 15. But if my policy said move down, it would be zero. Okay, so when I said that thing about v, v pi of s, that is v pi of s where pi is a random policy. Okay, all right. So policy evaluation or value evaluation, policy evaluation. Excuse me. Let's compute the state value function v pi for an arbitrary policy pi. So what we just did here was we computed the state value function v pi when pi was equiprobable actions. So when the probability of taking action one, two, three, or four were all one over four. Okay. And the way we did that so you didn't know that you just used the Bellman equation, but you did use the Bellman equation. All right. So this equation is a little bit complicated, but really all of these summation formulas are just iterations. They're for loops, right? So we just did a for loop up here, right? But what we actually did was this summation. Okay. So let's go step by step with what this uh, formula does. Let me see. Okay. So this part of the formula, so this is v pi of s, right? That was that 15 that we just calculated. Our pi for that example was an equiprobable policy. So this says, okay, what does the first summation here say? This says we're going to look over each action and consider what the policy says about taking that action at that state. So. This says for each action, we're going to multiply this term by the probability of taking that action, okay? So this function here, for our previous example, each of these was just one over four, right? So we went over, we went for this action, for this action, for this action, for this action, the probability of each of those was one over four, okay? Now, this term right here is the probability of transitioning from one state to another, right? So this says the probability that action A takes us from S to S prime, all right? So that meant that given we had chosen going up, what is the probability we actually get to up? Well, that was one. It was 100% because we're dealing with a deterministic environment. So this here gives us that wiggle room to do this for a non-determin for a um, non-deterministic environment, but most of our environments are going to be deterministic. So let's move to the next slide, because if our environment is deterministic, then this term here is always going to be one, so it just disappears from the equation altogether. 
okay? And we're left with this, which is exactly what we did in the last slide. What we did was we took the probability of each action occurring, and then we took the reward from doing that action, and we added to gamma times the value of the next state. Now, let me go back because we didn't do something here. Here, I did not include any reward from actually doing the action, okay? But it's possibly the case that our reward from here was non-zero, but what we did was we just assumed that the reward was zero, okay? So what we did for our example was we just said, okay, the reward from doing those actions were all zero, and our gamma was equal to one, right? So if we look here, we took for each action, it was one over four, and then we had to take the, the value of the next state, v pi of s prime, which was the 20, the 10. So this here is the v prime or the v pi of s prime. That's what the 10 is here, okay? And that's what the 20 is, that's what the zero is, that's what the 30 is. So we just looped over each one. We found the probabilities, well, from our policy, which was one quarter. We took each of the values, we divided it by that, pro by that probability, and then we summed them all together. And that's exactly what we do here, okay? So we sum together the values of the next states multiplied by gamma. We just used gamma equal to one because it's, it's a lot simpler mathematically. We didn't have a reward, but if we had a reward, we would add that there. And then we summed all those val values together. And so this looks a little bit complicated and it's new terminology that you haven't seen before, but this is a very simple update in code. So let me move my, uh, my thing down. Okay. So here's what we do in code, because I personally still have problems thinking of things in terms of mathematical functions. I don't know if you're the same out there, let me know in the chat. But when I look at a mathematical function, it's like a deer in the headlights. I need to see the code of how you implement the function in order to truly understand it. So here is that code. We're going to take v of s, okay? So v of s, I'm just leaving out the pi because it's, you can't put a pi in a variable name, right? So v of s is the value of state s. And let's just say that this is, v is an array and it's indexed by the state, okay? So p of s a is your policy. So p for policy, and that's the probability of doing action a at state s. So this is p of s a is this term right here. All right, so this is P, it's your policy, pi, of SA. So you've just got some value here, which says at this state, my probability of doing this action is, is A. And before, so if we had it uh, right here, then if we had P of S for each of these actions, Right, so P of S would be an array equal to one quarter, one quarter, and one quarter all the way down, okay? So if we looked up P of S zero, that's one over four. P of S one is one over four, okay? So that's what P of S A is. It stores those probabilities of taking the actions at a given state. Then, for each state, in the environment, we're going to do this update function for each state of the environment. So we're going to set vs equal to zero because we're going to be doing a summation. And whenever we do a summation, we initially have to set the value to zero, right? Then for each legal action, a at state s, that's what this part is doing. That's saying that's a for loop for each legal action at state s. P we're gonna set P equal to the probability of choosing A at state S. So the way we find that is just by looking up P of S A, okay? And now I should probably have, um, let me actually change that variable name because we have two things named, um, named P now. 
So I'm going to change that to PR. All right, so that's a little bit better. So instead of having P, we have PR. So PR is the probability of choosing state A or action A at state S. And remember, we have that stored in this array up here. R is this big R up here. And that's the reward that we get from doing action A, which took us from state S to state S prime. So in your environment somewhere, like if you were doing, if you're playing poker, right, and you won some money, this would be a positive reward. If you're playing blackjack and you win, and you lose, this would be a negative reward. So this comes from your environment. You just get a reward from do, you say environment dot do action A at state S, it will return you some reward. S prime is the next state. So if you're thinking of like um, the pathfinding example, well, when we do action A from state S, it's going to move us up, down, left, or right, for example. So S prime is just that next state. So we're going to apply action A to state S, and we get the next state. So S prime is the next state. So all we do then is we're going to add, remember how we did like uh, one quarter times 30 and then added that up? So VS, which is currently zero, remember, this is a summation here, right? We're summing up all of these probabilities times the rewards. So VS plus equals the probability of having taken this action times the reward plus gamma times the next state value. That's it. So it's, to me, it's a lot easier to understand this code incrementally than it is to understand this, this formula. However, once you get used to the formula and you can see, oh, that's the for loop where we sum this stuff up, then it becomes much more convenient in a textbook to represent it in this form, right? But in my opinion, for me to fully understand that, it's, um, this is necessary. This, this code, sorry, is necessary. All right. So an example that we showed uh, for before was this example of a grid world, right? And grid world just meaning um, here, for example, if we didn't know the value of this state, for example, we could apply that Bellman equation to um, this we could apply the Bellman equation with the policy in order to get these values. Okay, so if I can remove this discount, this for a second, we would apply the Bellman equation here. Ah. Uh, so we have our policy, which tells us to move left. Okay, and I took this from the book and I don't have the value of gamma. So I can, I think the value of gamma is 0.9 or something like that. But if we take the probability of going to all these states surrounding this one and apply the Bellman equation like we did before, we would get this value. Okay, so that's the Bellman equation. It looks very scary at first, but when you break it down, it's not so bad. Okay, and the Bellman equation is a pretty good exam question, being able to answer questions about that. All right, so now let's talk about the policy update, right? Uh, let me move this up. So reinforcement learning is all about getting smarter over time. It's about learning. And if all we do is just learn the values of actions, then that's no good. We want to update our policy so that we take more intelligent actions the next time. So our policy update ends up being really, really simple, actually. It's taking the action at state S, which has the highest value, right? So if we look, the action value function of, a, of an action at a given state, very similar to the Bellman equation, okay? But we just computed that. So if we want to know the value of doing action A at state S, we just look up the value of the resulting state S prime, right? So if we go back, let me show you an example of this because it's much easier. The value of doing action up at this state is 20 because we get to a state 
where we have a value of 20. The value of moving left here will be 30. So what do we want to do at this state? If we have these neighbors with these values, right? How would we update our policy? Well, obviously we want to go to the state with the highest value. So on the next time step, we would look over each action and we'd say, okay, which action leads us to the state with the highest value? So we'd look, okay, here's 20, that's good. 10, that's not as good. Zero, no, 30. Oh, wow, okay. So here is where I wanna go next. So at this state, I'm going to update my policy so that I move to the left because I want to go to the place that has the best reward. Okay. Um, do do do. Gotta go. Gotta go fast. All right. So my policy update now is very very easy. So policy pi prime. Remember prime just means the next thing, right? So I have a current policy. I look at the values around me, and I say how do my how do I update my policy for the next time step? Well, I just take the action which maximizes the value of going to the next state. This is really easy. I, I just did that. So you look around, there's the 30, that's the highest one. So I set my action equal to that one. So here's the policy update in code. Cause it's possible that I had, well, here's, here's another example, okay? Um, let's say uh, I'm currently here, going up would give me four, right would give me zero, down would give me four, this is a four, supposedly, and going left would give me one, okay? So, when I update my policy, I'm gonna say, oh, well, I can get the maximum value by going up or by going down. So, what I could say here is I could set my policy to say, with 50% probability go up, and with 50% probability go down, okay? And I usually do want to do that, because I want to make sure that I'm visiting um, all of the highest valued states. So here's how we do that in code. So P of SA, that's my, that's my, um, my policy, right? My probability of choosing an action at a state. Now I'm going to need to record some, some values, which states had the maximum values, okay? So for each legal action A at state S, I'm gonna do the following thing. I'm going to figure out which state I get to by doing this action. So for example, if I'm at state S in that previous diagram, the action up would take me to that state above it. So that would be this S prime, right? The value, now this, this variable value, I'm just gonna set it to V of S prime, cause that's the value. So going up in my example before, this would be 20, going left would be 30, okay? If my value is a new maximum value, then I'm going to push this value into max vals, right? So that means if that's a new maximum value, then I'm going to record all the maximum values that I have. Then for each legal action A at S, it says for A in max vals, the probability of doing action A at the state is one divided by the number of max vowels. So I'll show you an example of that to make this, this little function make sense because it's much easier in an example than it is in code. But we're going to update the policy with equiprobable choice of selecting from all the actions with the maximum value. So let's do an actual example here, okay? So let's say we're at state S and we have five possible actions that we wanna do. A1 through A5. Those doing those actions at state S are going to yield new states S1 through S5. Okay, so if I do action one, I get to S1. If I do action two, I get to S2, all the way up to S5. Those state values, S1 through S5, are equal to S1 has, has value 10, S2 has value zero, S3 has value 10, S4 has value five, S5 has value 10. So the actions which maximized my value, well, if you look here, there's three tied maximum values, okay? So going to state one, state three, or state five, 
via action one, action three, or action five, those are the ones which maximized my value. So the new policy is going to be with an equiprobable chance, take action one, take action three, and take action five. So my new policy, right, at state S is going to be, because there was three of these, it's one divided by three. So action one, we're going to have a one third chance of taking action one. We don't want to take action two at all because it did not lead us to a maximum value. Um, we're gonna have a one third chance of taking action three because it led us again to a maximum value. We're gonna have a 0% chance of going to action five or action four, and we're going to have a one third chance of action five. So since actions one, action three, and action five led me to the highest possible value, and there's three of them, each of these have a one over three chance of being the, the, the action that I take at that state. So if we go back to that line of code, it says, if the action is in the maximum valued actions, then I want to take the probability of that action happening at that state is one divided by the number of actions which led me to the maximum value. Okay, so that makes a little bit more sense now that we've seen this example, okay? So value and policy iteration is really what it's all about, okay? So this is what reinforcement learning is all about, is obtaining optimal policies, right? Obtaining the optimal policy involves these two steps that are repeated over and over and over until you get a good policy. So first, we're going to update our value estimates based on the policy that we have. So we have some policy initially, we're going to implement it, we're going to see how our values change. And then based on the values that we get, we're going to update the policy to choose actions which lead us to the maximum valued states. And this, these two things, turns out this is something called generalized policy iteration. And we'll go into that a little more in a, in a future slide or in a future lecture. But that is, this is reinforcement learning in a nutshell. And we showed here the example of how to do that using, um, using the Bellman equation and dynamic programming. But that's not what we're going to do on the, on the, the, uh, assignments, sorry, or on the pro or on the project for 6980, because as I said before, uh, the dynamic programming solution requires a perfect model of the environment. You need to know the exact transition probabilities and stuff. And so it's not a sample based method. And since it's not a sample based method, it's not really usable in real life. Okay. So while it's theoretically correct, and it's the thing that we want to approximate in practice, we cannot use dynamic programming in um, in reinforcement learning. So some possible exam questions from these slides. Um, you want to know action value versus state value. So this is Q versus uh, Q versus V. You want to know the properties of an MDP and the definition of an MDP. You want to be able to do uh, an example dynamic programming calculation. So if I give you a little grid world with the values of neighboring states and the probabilities and, a, and rewards and gamma, you, you would want to update the value of that uh, state. And you also want to know how to do this policy update, right? So the policy update being this example right here. So on an exam, I could give you um, the first three lines here. Okay, so five actions uh, going to these states, the states have these values, what should my new policy be? That could be an exam question. All right, cool. All right, and here's the time at which I would have run the uh, the Connect Four competition. But as I said, I will be, um, I, I'm not doing that because uh, I, I don't have them back yet. So someone said really quickly that I've got the Remembrance Day lecture incorrect. Well, let's go look. I do have it incorrect. Okay, we that's that's good. <laughs> so, oops, um, we do have a lecture on Tuesday. It's Thursday, so I need to switch these. I will make a D2L announcement about that 
I sincerely apologize. Um, how could I forget where Remembrance Day was? So it's November 11th, not November 9th. Okay, so keep that in mind. I will announce it on D2L and on Discord that that is the case. Okay, so we will, we'll still be doing the, the thing, the, the thing next time though, the, the tournament. All right, thanks so much for tuning in and uh, I'll see you in the next lecture.